want to thank Josette, a good friend of mine for many years and a former colleague in the Bush administration, uh, for organizing this event today. Um, it's nice to be able to kick off a series, uh, this during the UN General Assembly week. Um, I know tomorrow you'll be hearing from Minister Jai Shankar, whom I worked closely with uh, when he was in office, out of office, and back in office. So you've got a very good roster of speakers. I want to examine today um, the Islamic Republic's revolutionary expansionism, which is at the heart of the, of the region's instability and the core of Iran's foreign policy. President Trump's first overseas visit was to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The trip underscored our commitment to partners in the Middle East. The President reaffirmed our goal of working closely with them and others around the world to combat violent extremism. As the President said in Riyadh, one of the great challenges of our time is to, quote, conquer extremism and vanquish the forces of terrorism. Defeating terrorism and the corrosive ideology that drives it, the President said, is vital for peace in the Middle East. And as part of this message, uh, the President called out Iran for its continued support of terrorism. He condemned the Islamic Republic for fueling the fires of sectarianism and called on all nations of conscience to work together to isolate Iran and to deny the regime the funding it needs to conduct its foreign policy. Since the President's visit in May, the United States has imposed unprecedented pressure on the Iranian regime in order to deny it funding for terrorism. Our pressure is making the regime's ex extremist foreign policy and the ideology that drives it more expensive than ever before. This was long overdue. The regime has spent nearly $16 billion supporting its proxies in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen over the last several years. It has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on the Houthis in Yemen. And it gives more than $100 million a year to Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Our maximum pressure campaign is reducing this cash flow and denying the regime of billions of dollars. Our oil sanctions alone are denying the regime up to $50 billion. Iran's proxies, including Hezbollah, are already complaining of a lack of funding. And as our pressure continues, it will be harder for Iran's proxies to get by. We call on all nations to join us in this effort. It is the right thing and it is the responsible thing to do, both morally and strategically. Another key objective of our policy is to pressure the regime into changing its destabilizing behavior. We seek comprehensive negotiations that are truly comprehensive. This includes the nuclear file, but it also includes Iran's role in the region, its missile development, its support for terrorism, and its hostage taking, including many American citizens. Since the Iranian cleric seized power in 1979, the world has sought but failed to address the full scope of these activities. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was insufficiently comprehensive. The Islamic Republic's destabilizing ballistic missile program, its support for terrorism, its wrongful detention of American citizens were not part of the agreement, nor were they put on the table after the agreement was uh, concluded. In fact, the ban on Iran's ballistic missile testing and development was relaxed under the Iran nuclear deal. Consequently, Iran's malign activity not only, in, uh, not only continued, but in many cases, worsened. After 40 years of trying and falling short, what has been the international community's response to Iran's continued malign behavior? It has been to temper its expectations, narrow the scope of its demands, and ultimately play by Iran's rules. The Iran nuclear deal very much reflected this calculus. This approach has only fueled the regime's expansion across the region a story that one hears repeatedly from countries in the Middle East on the front lines of Iranian aggression. We are trying to challenge the status quo. We are rejecting the defeatist mentality 
that has creeped into the world's approach to Iran and tilted the balance in its favor. We are not only exposing the scale and the scope of Iran's malign activity, we are actively seeking to diminish its role in the region and reverse the gains that it made during the negotiation and implementation of the Iran nuclear deal. We are also shedding light on one of the root causes of its extremism, which I want to discuss here today at the Asia Society, its violent revolutionary expansionism. The Islamic Republic's never-ending quest to lead the Muslim world has led it to adopt a revolutionary foreign policy that is among the greatest and most overlooked obstacles to peace. If we hope to realize a more stable Middle East and a brighter future for its own people, we must appreciate the Islamic Republic's ideological commitment to exporting revolution. The world must together press the regime to change its behavior and to play by the rules. There is no more fitting time or place to have this discussion than on the margins of the UN General Assembly today. I want to start this conversation with a historical reference point. In 1981, two years after Iran's 1979 revolution, and one year after the start of the Iran-Iraq War, Supreme Leader Khomeini summed up the global aspirations of the newly formed Islamic Republic. As he said then, the Islamic Republic had, quote, set as its goal the worldwide spread of the influence of Islam. He added that, quote, we wish to cause the corrupt roots of Zionism, capitalism, and communism to wither throughout the world. We wish to destroy the systems which are based on these three foundations and to promote the Islamic order of the prophet. His mission was inherently an ideological one, and his aspirations were truly global. Soon after the Shah was deposed by a large and diverse cross-section of Iranians, the country's extremist clerics acted quickly to squash dissent and rid Iran of secular parties, traditions, and institutions. Many Iranians disagreed with the clerics' vision of religious rule, but they were dealt with brutally, a harbinger of things to come. Thousands of Iranians were killed or jailed in the period immediately after the revolution. Thousands more fled the country. Ultimately, clerical rule prevailed in Iran. To Khomeini and his advisors, the only genuine form of acceptable authority is religious authority. All others were viewed as illegitimate forms of government. The Islamic Republic's early foreign policy vision reflected this view. In 1979, Khomeini made his vision very clear, quote, we shall export our revolution to the whole world. He said, until the cry, there is no God but Allah, resounds over the whole world, there will be struggle. Non-theocratic societies became targets of Iranian aggression. In remarks on the eve of Nowruz in 1980, Khomeini underscored that spreading the revolution was at the heart of the Islamic Republic's founding. Quote, we shall confront the world with our ideology. We should try hard to export our revolution to the world. With the rise of Islamist terror groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS today, we have grown accustomed to this kind of extremist rhetoric and the global jihadi aspirations of violent Islamists. However, it was unique then, back in 1979. It was the first time in the 20th century that Shia clerics seized political power, violently rid a state of secular institutions, and put in place Islamic government committed to revolutionary expansionism. The expansionist view of the revolution's role in the world was among the Islamic Republic's most important organizing first principles. Today, it remains one of its most enduring. The current supreme leader, Khamenei, has remained faithful to this vision 
of revolutionary expansionism. In a 2013 speech to religious leaders, he reaffirmed that, quote, the final goal cannot be anything less than creating a brilliant Islamic civilization encompassing many countries. Under his rule, Iran has maintained its support to terrorist proxies, expanded its funding to Shia militias in Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, and continued to organize acts of terrorism globally across five continents. Over the last 40 years, there has been a remarkable consistency to how the Islamic Republic has sought to advance its foreign policy of revolutionary expansionism. It has and continues to view foreign relations as a way of solidifying its revolution at home and extending it abroad. The Islamic Republic co-ops and undermines the structures of the modern state, especially the principle of sovereignty and the tools of diplomacy, to subvert international norms, advance its malign objectives, and export revolution. An irony too many nations overlook at their peril. This irony, however, did not escape Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. In reflecting on it, he noted that, quote, with Iran's revolution, an Islamist movement dedicated to overthrowing the Westphalian system gained control over a modern state. Iran's clerics asserted the Westphalian privileges afforded to it as a sovereign state, while at the same time making clear that they do not believe in those privileges, would not be bound by them, and ultimately sought to replace them. Since the 79 revolution, the leaders of the Islamic Republic have been welcomed into the community of nations. They have taken their seat at the United Nations and today enjoy the privileges of statehood. Yet their revolutionary commitment to tearing this community apart by violating its most fundamental norms endures. This includes the sovereignty of other nations, freedom of navigation, and the principle of using diplomacy over violence. The best example of this is how the regime leverages and unleashes on the region its Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The IRGC appears on the surface to operate like a traditional military force. It has an air force and a navy and a special operations branch. It has a traditional command and control structure. It has generals, training facilities, and internal doctrines. Accordingly, it benefits from the privileges that are accorded to Westphalian states. Yet if you look under the hood, there is very little normal about the IRGC. At its core, it is an organization designed to protect the revolution at home and advance the revolutionary ideology abroad. It has institutionalized terror. It fuels regional instability. And it protects the narrow interest of Iran's elite. The IRGC exports Iran's revolution to places like Iraq, Lebanon, and the Palestinian territories. Revolutionary expansion is at its core. Let's consider, for example, the IRGC decades-long involvement in Lebanon. Since the early 1980s, the IRGC has undermined Lebanese sovereignty to cement Iran's influence in the Levant. The regime has historically provided Hezbollah with up to 70% of its operating budget. It has poured precision rockets and missiles and small arms and a steady stream of military experts into Lebanon, undermining the integrity of the Lebanese state. Hezbollah's military prowess enables Iran to extend its own borders and target Israelis and Americans. Hezbollah has killed more Americans than any terrorist group other than al-Qaeda. We can also look to the IRGC's role in Yemen. There, the Islamic Republic feigns support for diplomacy. While using the, revolution, the revolutionary tools of the IRGC to undermine peace and security. As I wrote in a, in a recent Wall Street Journal editorial, Iran is using Yemen to increase its status as a regional power 
and extend the borders of its revolution yet again. IRGC military assistance has allowed the Houthis to challenge the authority of the Yemeni government in ways that otherwise would have been impossible. The IRGC provides the Houthis with hundreds of millions of dollars and, and an arsenal of advanced weaponry, anti-ship missiles, explosive-laden boats, and mines have flowed into Yemen thanks to Khomeini. The IRGC's activities, with the examples of Lebanon and Yemen, are two cases that are inconsistent with international norms, yet are entirely consistent with the regime's revolutionary worldview. In this case, state sovereignty is a pliable concept that Iran invokes when it's useful, but is otherwise under continual assault by Iran's IRGC and its Quds Force. This is why Secretary Pompeo took the historic step of designating the IRGC and the Quds Force as a foreign terrorist organization in April. This was the first time that the United States had designated a government entity as a foreign terrorist organization, a decision that was long overdue when you examine the unprecedented support for terrorist proxies around the world. With this designation, the IRGC joins a list that includes many of the same terrorist organizations that it actively supports and sponsors. This includes Hezbollah, Hamas, PIJ, Qatab Hezbollah, and Al-Ashtar Brigades. All of these organizations are foreign terrorist organizations, and all of them benefit from the IRGC's active patronage. The United States is dispelling the fiction that the IRGC operates like a normal state actor. It simply does not. I think it would be uh, all too familiar to rehearse the many ways that Iran has violated international norms in just the last few months, let alone the last 40 years. Scores of books have documented the regime's taste for violence and brutality to advance its revolution which is a hallmark of its ideological roots. Yet despite the regime's actions in defiance of our shared values, there is a dangerous culture of inaction within the international community when these norms are violated. Rather than hold Iran to account, the impulse is to paper over Iran's duplicity. Nations look the other way pretending to believe Foreign Minister Zarif's version of reality, even when they know it not to be true. To give a recent example, nations watched video footage of the IRGC Navy handle a limpet mine next to a tanker that was set on fire by the IRGC Navy. Zarif told the world that the Navy was actually coming to the rescue of the crew and was dismantling the mine. The world believed it, or at least pretended to even though the claim on its face is absurd. Fewer than five nations in the world condemned Iran by name for the tanker attacks. And yet the video, which everyone can see, shows that the IRGC personnel took no safety precautions when approaching or removing the mine, suggesting they knew how it was intended to function and exactly where it was located. The procedures the IRGC personnel followed were inconsistent with standard safety practices that any explosive ordnance disposal, disposal team would employ when approaching an unknown ordnance. The removal of the mine was an attempt by Tehran to hide its involvement in the attacks. Those who listened with credulity and accepted Zarif's sophistry weakened the very international norms that we are here in New York to defend and strengthened. An even more recent example is Iran's attack on Saudi Arabia. We know based on intelligence and open source analysis that these attacks were conducted by Iran. We are confident in this assessment. The evidence, including the complexity, scope, and impact of the attack indicates this is the case. Yet Iran, from its president on down, has maintained that the Houthis are responsible. Let me be clear.
The attacks were more complex, larger in scale, and more precise than anything the Houthis are capable of executing. Accepting the Iranian version of events undermines international security and conveniently demands nothing of nations in response. Iran's diplomats are very skilled, and they understand the importance of appearing to maintain a fidelity to well-established international norms and principles, even as they violate them. In 1981, shortly after the revolution, Khomeini lamented the Islamic Republic was not doing enough to refine its image abroad. As he assessed, Iran had been, quote, at near zero in its propaganda abroad. Maintaining a positive image was vital to spreading the revolution. Iran knows the value of strategic messaging. Iran knows that if it is not playing the manage, if it is not playing messaging offense, that it is losing. The international community, including the United Nations, buys into this routine more often than it challenges it. Take, for example, a few months ago, when the UN appointed the Islamic Republic to a seat on the Commission on the Status of Women. The Commission promotes gender equality and women's empowerment. By the UN's own standards, Iran has no place on such a body. In Iran, according to the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, women who do not wear a veil are subject to a prison sentence, flogging, or a fine. Iranian women peacefully advocating for their rights are routinely subject to harsh punishments. Inviting Iran to serve on this commission was like inviting the arsonist to help put out the fire. It is, however, standard practice now. Rather than challenge the Islamic Republic's policies, the first instinct is to accommodate, explain, and to make room. This approach rewards the Islamic Republic's bad behavior and invites even more of it. What would it look like to challenge Iran's record on human rights? We saw a recent example of this just last week when FIFA challenged the regime's policy that prohibits women from attending soccer matches. Following the tragic self-immolation of an Iranian woman who was protesting the rule, FIFA condemned Iran and the world joined. Amidst mounting pressure, Iran agreed to permit women to attend the next international match. We will have to see if it follows through on this pledge. This kind of concerted global pushback and demanding accountability against Iran is unfortunately the exception, not the rule. If we challenged Iran more than we accommodated it, we would see more and more positive change in behavior. The Islamic Republic of Iran is the last revolutionary regime in the world. Unpacking its ideology provides us with a more accurate understanding of its role in world affairs today. Ideology is certainly not the whole story. Iran's leaders are pragmatic. They are pragmatic revolutionaries who weigh risks like anyone else. The decisions they end up making are always at the nexus between pragmatism and ideology. There is always room for negotiation, flexibility, and compromise. However, their ideology, rooted in the strong sense of revolutionary expansionism that I have laid out today, plays an outsized role in shaping the contours and contexts of their foreign policy. It helps explain why Iran's leaders provide weapons to proxies in secret while denying it in public or why they orchestrate terrorist attacks, then blame Western nations as soon as they are exposed. The regime's revolutionary expansionism is at odds with values around the world, and it is at odds with the values, aspirations, and principles of the United Nations. It is now up to Iran's leaders to decide whether to continue business as usual and invite even more pressure from the United States or to meet us at the table. We hope pragmatism will prevail, but we are equally prepared to defend our interests if it does not. Iran's leaders must change their approach.
they must reconcile their revolutionary foreign policy with international principles and norms. The two are fundamentally incompatible. They should lead their nation in the noble tradition of the leaders who came before them. Historic figures like Cyrus the Great, the biblical, uh, who biblical prophets said was destined to save the Jewish people. Cyrus is nothing like Iran's current leaders who call for Israel's destruction. Iran's leaders must abide by, rather than subvert, the international order. Once they do, they can take up their place in the community of nations. However, until then, our pressure will continue. We are raising the costs of Iran's revolutionary adventures while increasing the incentives for pragmatism to prevail. The international community needs to be a part of this effort. Nations around the world need to hold Iran accountable and join us in pressing for a change in behavior. Silence amounts to complicity. As I mentioned, we are doing our part. Our pressure campaign is aimed at changing the regime's behavior and bringing Iran back to the negotiating table so that diplomacy can prevail. We want Iran to end its support for terrorist groups and reject extremism. We want Iran to use diplomacy to meaning, meaningfully address and resolve conflicts, not as a sleight of hand to fuel and prolong them. We want Iran to respect the sovereignty of all nations, whether they are a friend or an enemy. We want Iran to spend less time scheming on how to undermine its international obligations and more time figuring out how to live up to them. Iran's aggression over the last several months makes clear that it does not want to be challenged in this way. It means we are doing the right thing. Iran has conditioned us to accept a regular level of violence out of fear of something worse. This practice is known as extortion. The regime seeks to buy our silence by acting like the biggest outlaw regime in the world. They create conflicts through violence, then act as if they are the only ones who can solve them. The world is tired of living in fear of Iranian aggression. I know from firsthand experience that countries in the region certainly are. This is why Israelis and Arabs have come together in new ways to ask the world to hold the Iranian regime accountable. They are tired of the violence and tired of the world believing Iran's lies and having it both ways. Our efforts are aimed at addressing these concerns so that peace has a chance. The international community's efforts should be focused on this too. We must all strive to, to contain uh, Iranian expansion, constrain Iranian expansion in places like Lebanon, Syria, the Golan Heights, Iraq, and Yemen. The world must come to terms with Iran's ambitions and counter them, or the Iranian crescent will soon enough become a full moon. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brian, and welcome to your first public event here at Asia Society. Thank you. It's very good to have you. So this week is the week of the UN General Assembly, and all eyes are on President Trump and President Rouhani. President Trump will speak tomorrow, President Rouhani on Wednesday. And it's believed they'll each set forth a very different vision for security in the Middle East. Also, there's all sorts of behind the scenes diplomatic activity and some flurry of expectation that maybe President Trump and President Rouhani will meet. Can you t give us some preview of what's gonna be happening? Well, the president now for a couple of years has said that he would meet with President Rouhani. Uh, Secretary Pompeo said a number of months ago that he would meet with the Iranians without preconditions. This is a uh, a commitment that has been made many, many times over the last few years. Uh, Iran has yet to accept our offer. That offer was made while we were still in the Iran deal, and the offer was not accepted. And it's very clear to make. You have to look at the history of this. We have offered to meet with the Iranians many times while we were in the deal, and they refused. And so after the president got out of the deal, we continued to offer uh, diplomatic um, outcomes. The, uh, the Iranians have not met diplomacy with diplomacy. They have met our diplomacy with military force. This is not the first time uh, when you put pressure on the regime, it reaches for the usual playbooks of uh, 
of uh, either nuclear extortion or threatening much higher levels of violence than we are accustomed to or that we've decided to accept, as I said in my remarks. Um, I do think that the attacks in Saudi Arabia, uh, French Foreign Minister Le Drian said uh, today or yesterday that these attacks are a game changer. Um, Secretary Pompeo has, has talked with foreign ministers in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East. Um, it is clear that Iran has crossed the line. Um, by this attack on another country's sovereignty, the dozens of attacks on freedom of navigation, which is a core principle, it's a core norm that I think the international community believes should be defended. Um, it is, uh, I, I, the, the president said recently, a couple of days ago, that somebody asked, are, are the doors to diplomacy closed? And he said, no, they're not. Um, but that's, that's a choice that Iran uh, has to make. Uh, they need to decide, they have to make a choice. They can either behave like a normal nation where they continue uh, to experience uh, declined international support for what they're doing. There was a, a story today that David Sanger did in the New York Times that, 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 that shows that things are very different for Iran now when they come to this General Assembly. And um, they are experiencing the kind of diplomatic isolation that I think their threats to peace and security deserve. And, and the example of FIFA is very, uh, very instructive uh, when threatened with the possibility of being locked out of FIFA, uh, they moved very quickly to change their policy. And so that's a change in behavior. They have gone from, a woman, from women, if they go to a soccer match, or this particular woman uh, was arrested and then sentenced to jail um, and then committed suicide. Um, I saw Foreign Minister Zarif say this is very sad and tragic and it was based on a misunderstanding. This is another example of how he sort of has it both ways, presenting a kind of Westphalian face to the world, but in fact at home, running a very different playbook. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, you said with greater certainty that I thought I've heard that Iran was behind the Saudi attacks. And will you be presenting what the U.S. has built as evidence to that to the other uh, signatories to the agreement. Is that part of the diplomatic push this week? Well, I would just say John Kerry said um, the, Iran's are, uh, the Iranians are behind these attacks. Um, uh, the UK foreign minister said Iran is behind the attacks. Uh, Saudi has said it. If you look at the missiles that have been recovered um, in Saudi Arabia, and we have, we have UN teams in Saudi, uh, there are also, uh, there's one European country that also has a team in Saudi, and they're doing the site exploitation. If you look at the missiles that were fired, and if you place those missiles in Yemen, they cannot reach Abqaiq. They just don't have the range. Um, if you look at the satellite imagery, it's very clear that the spheroids and the, uh, the columns that were attacked came from the north. You can see the burn marks. Um, it's, uh, and the, the Houthi said that there were 10 attacks. It was struck 19 times. So even the Houthis can't back up their own claim. The Iraqi government put out a public statement that said that the, the attacks did not originate in, Ira uh, in Iraq. Secretary Pompeo spoke to the Iraqi for, uh, prime minister, and he said, I agree with you. They did not originate in Iraq. So I think as the exploitation of the site, the forensic analysis is concluded, which we hope is very soon, but we want to be very careful about this. Um, perhaps in the recovery of the, uh, of the debris, will be in the uh, people, the Saudis, perhaps the UN will be able to announce the origin of these attacks. So it seems that we're entering an impasse. Um, the uh, Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, said just yesterday, accused Secretary Pompeo of economic terrorism. He said diplomacy is off the table and kind of ruled out that there'd be any meetings. I know you wouldn't tell us if there's any meetings planned, but... Um, how do we avoid war in this situation? And how could the U.S. and others who are concerned let an attack like that stand? And wouldn't that be an invitation if you have confidence in the origin of that, that if it's not met with a swift response, that that becomes the new norm? I think that's a great question. Certainly, um, if these attacks, um, if there isn't any consequence for these attacks, there will, this will be a teaching moment to other rogue nations around the world, and aspiring rogue nations. 
uh, they, they look to their left and their right to see if there will be any accountability for violating the most fundamental norms of respecting sovereignty and respecting freedom of navigation. So I think there are a few bodies that can play an important role. I think the UN Security Council, once the Saudis report their findings to the Council, uh, the Council has been invested by the UN Charter with the maintenance of international peace and security. Uh, clearly the Iranian attacks violate various provisions of the UN Charter. Uh, the, the Council has a role to play here. Um, one of the roles that they could and should play is to extend the UN arms embargo on Iran that expires in 12 months under the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, as part of the Iran nuclear deal in year five, uh, in October, where we're coming up uh, in one year, the UN arms embargo will expire on the world's leading sponsor of terrorism, and it will also lift the travel ban on 23 Iranians who have been uh, sanctioned by the United Nations for terrorism. And so the deal is going to start unraveling in 12 months, and it will successively unravel in the out years. We would like to see the Council renew the arms embargo and to renew the travel ban. We would like to see the European Union um, impose sanctions on those individuals and entities that are facilitating Iran's missile program and its drone program, uh, which is uh, behind these strikes. Um, we would like to see, I gave you the example of Iran, we have video footage of the IRGC removing limpet mines, and you had fewer than five countries call out Iran by name. Um, this, there has to be an international effort to enforce the norms that it purports to defend and believe in. Mm -hmm. um, you have said, though, that much of the world seems to be ignoring Iran's behavior. You, you sound frustrated. Are you referring to European allies, to China? Who, who's not, where do you feel the message is being ignored? It's, it, is, it is trying to find the balance that, to strike between Iran's aggression and the response by the international community. It is the case that the European Union has not taken any sanctions since adoption of the Iran deal on Iran's activities inside of the Middle East. They have taken uh, sanctions against Iran's Ministry of Intelligence for the terrorist activities and terrorist attempts in Europe. But um, I do believe that, we believe very strongly that the Iran nuclear deal, uh, you, you have modest and temporary non-proliferation gains that have come at the expense of missile proliferation, missile testing, regional aggression, and hostage taking. Um, being outside of the deal uh, gives us a great deal of leverage to address the entire range of threats uh, that Iran presents to the world. Um, I know that for those who negotiated the deal at the time, this was not supposed to be the last word on Iran's threats, and there were supposed to be successive efforts to address the missile program and the regional aggression. We, uh, we seek a comprehensive deal, and this was announced uh, 15, 16 months ago by Secretary Pompeo. We seek a comprehensive deal that addresses the threats around Iran's nuclear program, its missile program, and its regional aggression and the hostage taking. I've heard people say that the Secretary's lists of demands are unreasonable or unrealistic. Um, I would welcome anybody to go through that list and say what they would like Iran to keep doing. Uh, you can look through that list of 12 and you can find almost every one of those items in a UN Security Council resolution. That list of 12 reflected the global consensus prior to the Iran deal. But I think that after the conclusion of the deal, which ended up only focusing on the nuclear program, um, it had the consequence Iran interpreted as a green light to move out on the missile piece and the regional aggression. And from 2007 to about 2017, they were able to run an expansionist foreign policy without much consequence. And we are standing up to Iran in a way that doesn't have historic precedent. Iran does not like being told no. They are not accustomed to it. And they are raising the level of violence above their normal level of violence. We are trying to change this paradigm of Iran's expansionist foreign policy that I wanted to talk about today. So before we go to audience questions, I'm going to come back and ask you what the end game is. What does this look like and how does it play out if you succeed in your goals? But before that, um, so this November 4th marks 40 years since the seizure of the U.S. Embassy and the taking of 66 hostages, which really spiraled into many decades of hostilities and mistrust and distrust. 
I think the turning point came, and we have Jake Sullivan here, who was one of the key negotiators under the Obama administration for the deal to try to end or at least slow down the development of nuclear capacity in Iran. Um, But let me ask you a tough question Mm -hmm. for both you and Jake. In the last 10 years, where has Iran's behavior or advancement slowed? So if you look at Iraq, if you look at um, Yemen, if you look at Syria, if you look at Lebanon, if you look at Hezbollah, if you look at Hamas, where have we seen, for all the intensive diplomacy, a change in that behavior, even to this day with all of the really um, very strong diplomacy that you've been putting mm-hmm. forward with President Trump and Secretary Pompeo? I think that's a good question. We, we, we have a range of metrics that we keep on a dashboard uh, in, within the Iran Action Group to sort of judge the progress that we're making around this. Um, during, around what? To judge the progress externally to Iran in the region? Well, and internally. The mm-hmm. strength of the regime, the strength of its mm-hmm. economy, the strength of its proxies, the funding flows for uh, terrorist operations uh, and, and, other, uh, and other malign activities. So during the Iran nuclear deal, um, Iran was able to achieve record military budgets, record level budgets in its military spending. The first year when we came into office, started putting in place sanctions while we were still in the deal, Iran's military spending declined 10%. In March, when they released their budget for this year and the next year, 28% cut in military spending. This is a very good thing when Iran's military budget is being cut. It is a very bad thing when it reaches record levels, given, as I said, the nature of the regime. Iran enjoyed, I think, um, uh, I think the World Bank was projecting like something like, I can't remember, it was positive economic growth um, when we started putting in sanctions in place. Iran is now in a recession. Now, part of that, most of it is because Iran is a kleptocracy, and it prioritizes funding ideology over the, over the welfare of its own people. They're anywhere between 8 and 10 percent. They could be at double-digit negative growth now. In March, there was a front-page New York Times story documenting how Hezbollah and Iran's proxies in Syria are, are, are experiencing significant revenue shortfalls. Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, for the first time in its history, had to make a public appeal for charity. Those appeals were not being made under the Iran nuclear deal. There was an, uh, an Iranian Shia fighter who said, the golden days are gone and they're never coming back. Iran just doesn't have the money that it used to. That does not mean that we have eliminated Iran's asymmetric advantage in modern terrorism. Uh, The 9-11 attacks were very inexpensive uh, compared to the sort of damage that they inflicted in the United States. So uh, modern terrorism does have an asymmetric advantage. And so we're never, as long as Iran is committed to this, they're always going to be able to conduct either direct or deniable attacks But their proxies and the the regime are weaker today than when they were two and a half years ago. So to get to my my last question, and we have a whole range of questions here. Um, So what is the end game? When I talk to Iranian negotiators, they say Brian Hook and the administration just want regime change. Are you looking for a crack in the regime, regime change? And if that were to happen, or if your 12 conditions were to be met, and it did weaken the regime, what happens then? And we've seen throughout the world that when regimes collapse, it doesn't necessarily create a solution. The future of Iran will be decided by the Iranian people. It will not be decided by the United States government. We are committed to uh, affecting a change in the regime's behavior. Our policy is not regime change. Uh, In the past, we have seen uh, a change in the regime's behavior when you have diplomatic isolation and economic pressure. We saw this uh, in the run-up starting when Iran's nuclear program was referred to the UN Security Council in 05 or 06. A multilateral sanctions regime was put in place. Um, That pressure brought Iran back to the negotiating table. Our unilateral pressure has been more powerful than all the multilateral sanctions combined. And we know through looking at the the 40-year history of the regime that it does come to the negotiating table. If, if, If sort of talking about this nicely worked with the Iranians, we would have settled this decades ago. But they are a very tough and tenacious and skilled regime. Uh, And we do need to drive up the costs 
they, we have to impose costs on this sort of behavior, which violates so many international norms and standards. And we think this is the right policy uh, to have in place. We are ready to, to negotiate with the Iranians, but, but they have to desire peace more than they love war. Mm. And do you feel the European allies will be with you on this driving up the cost strategy? I think the press does overstate the transatlantic differences. We certainly have a tactical disagreement over the Iran nuclear deal. Open secret, nobody denies it. But we share the same threat assessment. Iran can never have a nuclear weapon. Uh, they don't need to enrich uranium to have a peaceful nuclear program. Um, they have condemned Iran's space launch vehicles. They've condemned the ballistic missile testing. They've condemned the missile proliferation. They have condemned terror financing, money laundering, hostage taking, all of it. Um, and if you look at everything that Europe has done since May of last year, uh, it, it is, it's quite a long list. And it's important that, that we give Europe credit for the work that it has done uh, to call out Iran when it does engage in acts of terrorism or other ma malign behavior and the arbitrary detention of dual national citizens, which is a hallmark of this regime for 40 years. You mentioned the, the, the diplomats that, the, that the, uh, the Iranians took hostage. So um, we do think that there is an opportunity for Europe to do more, but for other nations to do more. Um, we have seen examples, uh, I think about the example of in South Africa on apartheid, where people put in place an international sanctions regime and their economy was in a free fall. And that drove up the costs of this policy and I understand that South Africa and Iran are two entirely different countries, but the same principle applies. You have to make a policy prohibitively expensive. And, 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 and they need to find a better way forward. And we know that it's possible. Um, and, we, and they do have the example of great leaders in the past, like Cyrus the Great, uh, to emulate. Okay, so I'm going to give the first question to the New York Times, since you quoted David Sanger. It says, are any negotiations with Iran about a prisoner swap for detained Americans? Update us on this effort, please. Um, we don't uh, disclose uh, because it's very sensitive to families. Um, but um, I, I, I can't comment on that because we typically don't comment on that. Uh, we do know that the Americans that are being held in Evan prison are innocent. And if Iran would like to show uh, a sign of good faith, they should release the Americans who are innocently detained, um, especially the Princeton graduate student uh, who has a wife and kids. Um, and I've met with them and talked to them. Uh, I had one meeting with Abbas Arachi when we were inside the Iran nuclear deal. I presented him with a list of all the Americans uh, that have been arbitrarily detained. I asked for their immediate release. Uh, uh, Robert O'Brien uh, has been the special envoy for hostage affairs. And um, it's a priority for us to get all Americans released from Iran. I'll point out that they released uh, five Americans uh, at the conclusion of the Iran deal and then they picked up five more. This is a, a sort of game that the regime plays. There are many thousands of Iranian Americans who live in Iran and it's very easy for the regime to pick up another set of, of Iranian Americans and then put them in Evan prison and then to use that as negotiating leverage. Using human beings as pawns in this way is another example of violating international norms. Thank you. Another question, um, and I will preface it by saying both President Trump and Secretary Pompeo have said, as uh, Pompeo yesterday, we don't want war. Uh, we're looking for alternatives. It says, what are the U.S. options? Um, and would it be cyber attacks? What would be on the list of U.S. options other than war? Well, diplomacy. Uh, we are committed to diplomacy. Um, I, I think America has had... I clear, I mean, are you able to... I was just reading Bill Burns' book mm -hmm. and uh, Back Channel, where he goes through the history of making that deal and how developing those relationships and building up some rapport. Are you able to talk directly to anyone in the Iranian government, or is the diplomacy still working around that right now? Um, well, there is no back channel mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that is taking place. Uh, everything that you see in terms of the diplomacy is conducted in broad daylight. Mm -hmm. uh, the President and the Secretary of State have made clear, uh, as I said over the last few years, that we would like, we're, we're, we can sit down with the Iranians, uh, but they have not accepted that offer. And so 
in the meantime, uh, our strategy is going to intensify. Mm -hmm. um, we announced sanctions uh, last week. Uh, we will continue uh, to intensify the pressure on the regime uh, because we know in the past that it works. So what would rise to sending the signal that what happened in Saudi Arabia is not acceptable? I think, I think that's been conveyed. Uh, as I said, I think if, if you look at the various statements that have been made over the last uh, couple of years, and then also since May, we had uh, very good intelligence in early May that Iran, the regime, was plotting uh, imminent attacks in multiple theaters against American interests. Uh, we enhanced our force posture in the region and started you know, in, in deepening our engagement with our partners in the region, and we were able to disrupt uh, and deter some of those attacks. Uh, when you look at what they've done in Saudi Arabia, it is clear that we need to reestablish deterrence. The international community needs to reestablish deterrence. Um, the attacks that have occurred since May, especially on the oil tankers in Saudi Arabia, we have Americans that live and work in, for Saudi Aramco, uh, the number of nations that are, this is an international problem. It was an attack on the global energy market. Um, the Houthis launched uh, an Iranian missile at Riyadh's international airport. This is a G20 airport. And I've been saying this for more than a year. We are, we are one missile strike away from a regional war. And we are accumulating risk of a regional war if we do not reestablish deterrence and if and 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 if we if if we accept a culture of largely inaction and accepting iranian answers sort of having it both ways we are increasing the risk of a regional conflict and that's why it, this is a good week for us to be here to be working with uh, with other countries so that we can make the case of the need to restore deterrence against iranian aggression well, it would seem like that missile attack may have been the one missile attack that you feared. But um, what, you know, Secretary Pompeo warned against miscalculation. So, and I, I understand you've described that you're w walking a very narrow path here, but what kind of miscalculations would be of concern here? I think, all, I think Iran has, um, th th they have done since May 40 attacks. There are, we are aware of double that number including the failed attempts just since May. Um, we have made it clear that we will respond if we are attacked. Um, the Iranians, um, uh, I think, are watching to see how the world responds to what they did uh, to Saudi Arabia. And it's very important that we understand that the Iranians are watching. And the Iranians are very good at following Lenin's proverb of um, probing with bayonets, and that if you hit steel, you pull back, and if you hit mush, you keep, you keep at it. And th th this, is, this, is, this is an important time mm -hmm. for the world to come together. So to switch subjects yeah. completely, um, someone's raised the age-old debate about economic sanctions, and it says, continuing sanctions to the middle class people of Iran who want change and friendship with the U.S., won't that increase the power of the hardliners and won't it punish the middle class and not the wealthy? We don't fall into this trap of the hardliners and the moderates mm -hmm. in the regime. If you're in the regime, you're judged by your actions. And Foreign Minister Zarif is as responsible for the attacks as the supreme leader because he represents the government to the world. And so I think that the Iran deal for some was premised on the theory that if you, you identify the moderates and empower them, that over time the regime will moderate so that when the UN arms embargo expires, it won't, it won't matter. I, I don't understand why in, in a deal that you would allow the UN arms embargo to expire on Iran. It just doesn't make any sense to me, other than this theory that you're going to empower the moderates. That has not happened. And the Iran deal talks about that this deal will contribute to regional peace and stability. What we instead saw was, was, was in Iran, and I hear this in the region. And when, when the Israelis and, the, and so many Arab nations uh, finish each other's sentences, you've got to pay attention to that. There's something happening there. When you talk to the nations who are on the front lines of Iranian aggression, you hear the same analysis. And so... Um, that is one thing that I'll say about Iran's foreign policy, is that it has brought together uh, Arabs and Israelis in ways that we didn't think was possible. 
Uh, and we're gonna, we, we will continue to see more of that. Oh, I'm happy to answer yeah. the middle class. Um, so Iran's middle class, if you look at the history of the last 40 years, each decade the regime has continued to lose a different segment of society. Um, when you, I've looked at various polls that have been done, and when they are asked the question of who do you blame for um, uh, Iran's economy, when Rouhani came into office, inflation was at 39%. While we were still in the Iran deal, inflation was in the high 30s. He had not moved that. Uh, inflation now is probably near 50%. But there was a poll and they said that two-thirds of the Iranian people blamed Rouhani for not delivering on his economic promises in 2013. Um, the Iranian people have a 40-year history of this regime. And they understand how the regime enriches the elite prioritizes ideology over the welfare of its own people, and doesn't invest in its own people. And so um, when you look at uh, after the Iran deal and the sanctions relief were granted, you had people who were asking, um, why did this money go to Damascus and not to Tehran? Uh, why, did, why did the money go to, to, to fund all of these proxies and not go into managing our water resources, which has been a catastrophe? Um, there, there's a number of questions that we've seen the Iranian people, and it's the same questions the, that, that we are asking, that we would like to see Iran pull back to its own borders and start behaving more like a normal nation and less like a revolutionary cause. And I think that the Iranian people understand where to squarely put the blame on their economic troubles. Their standard of living has barely moved in 40 years. That is not because of American sanctions. So there's two Can I also say one more thing? Yeah, yeah. Our sanctions regime makes exceptions for food, medicine, medical devices, and agricultural products. The right. Happy to answer that. The Iranian regime does not comply with international financial standards, uh, uh, FATF standards. The Iranian regime does not follow them. There is no financial transparency in Iran's system because if you followed the money, you would see that it goes to terror finance and money laundering. And so uh, a few months ago, um, FATF had to put in countermeasures because Iran failed to comply with transparency measures. The reason why medical supplies do not find their way to the Iranian people is because the Iranian regime is not getting them to its own people. And you can Google this. President Rouhani's chief of staff sent a letter to the cabinet asking why, why did 1 billion euros in medical supplies disappear? They can't account for it. 100 billion euros. Uh, 1 billion euros in medical supplies they can't account for. And there's a number of examples that I've detailed in the past. Did you know that the IRGC uses front companies disguised as humanitarian organizations in order to enrich itself and to fund its operations? So if you are a European bank, the first rule as a banker is to know your customer. And Iran makes it impossible to know whether you are supporting commerce or terrorism. And that is not an accident. That is the way the regime has structured itself for the last 40 years. If you go to the Treasury website, it is in black and white. There are exemptions for food, medicine, medical devices, and agricultural products. The regime needs to do its part and adopt transparency standards to facilitate work between banks so that banks have comfort knowing that this money is not going to end up on the battlefields of Syria or used by Hezbollah to attack Israel or to be used by the Houthis uh, to, to fire missiles into Saudi Arabia. Hmm. It's not too much to ask to have Iran to have financial transparency. Go ahead and look at debates that were in, the, um, in Iran's parliament. There was one member of parliament who said, if we adopted this, people could see where the money goes. That would be a problem. So uh, we only have three more minutes, but uh, there's a question, a couple of questions. So one referring to the red line in Syria under the Obama administration and now referring to this attack in Saudi Arabia and how nervous should the region and the Gulf nations be about the U.S. actually not following through on, you know, a terrible attack, either of chemical weapons or in this case on that and how will we demonstrate um, that the U.S. will lead the kind of action that needs to be taken? We think that this is, uh, 
These attacks are international and they require an international response. That's very important. And that's the argument that Secretary Pompeo has been making to foreign ministers and leaders, is that this is, I mean, if, if you look at any oil tanker, you could probably identify up to 20 separate countries who have equities in that tanker. Um, and so when you looked at the tanker attacks, there were 35 nations that had interests, who were, interests were directly implicated in those attacks. Um, we are trying to bring together like-minded nations uh, to talk about the best way forward. I think it is clear that it is important that the, um, that the international community come together to talk about how do, we, how do we protect and defend principles of sovereignty and freedom of navigation and respect for human rights uh, in a way that is very prudent and very responsible. Uh, the president showed a great deal of restraint uh, by not taking military action after the Iranians shot down an American drone in international airspace. And so uh, when I went through the region, I heard that repeatedly. Um, so we're going to continue, uh, I think, to act prudently and to work as closely as possible uh, with our friends and partners. We think these attacks that Iran has committed is helping to make the case that we've been making for some time, that we are accumulating risk of a regional conflict if we don't restore deterrence. So if I could just, uh, last question here. Um, so it's, you seem to be saying that the approach, one approach to take would be to take this incident and put it into a comprehensive set of action. That sounds like that may be a year-long conclusion or negotiation. Or do you expect over the next couple of weeks to be able to say to the world, um, here's what we've been able to accomplish. So and I would add to that, in this week or two at the UN, what would you consider success coming out of that? And would we expect some sort of conclusion to um, come back at this action in Saudi Arabia? I think there are some steps that can be taken initially. As I said, the EU and other countries could play a role. Uh, Asian countries um, holding Iran's, uh, those, in, those people and organizations that are facilitating Iran's missile program. Um, I think in due course, there is a role for the, for the Security Council to play to promote international peace and security. But I don't want to get ahead of the process. It is very clear that, these, that Iran is behind these attacks. But we have the UN mm -hmm. and we've got the United States and some European countries that are doing the site analysis. And at the end of that process, I think when the facts are made known, the, the world will be in a better position to, to judge uh, the appropriate steps that are necessary. And just to say, so we're really, a, seem to be approaching the end of the situation in Syria with Idlib being the last stronghold. I mean, is there a threat of also it appearing that Iran and its allies have won there at the same time that this challenge is on the table? I wouldn't describe it that way. Uh, and I don't want to get into Jim Jeffries' lane uh, because he's our Syria envoy. But it is the case that Iran gave billions of billions of dollars to Assad. They were able to help organize 12,500 fighters, both uh, outside of Iran and those IRGC uh, forces. Um, when you're talking billions of dollars and 12,500 soldiers in a conflict, that can make a material difference in the prosecution of the war by Assad. So we have made clear that there will be no reconstruction assistance until we see Iranian forces out of Syria. I think that there are increasing incentives by both um, uh, Russia and Syria. For as long as Iran is using Syria as a forward deployed missile base to strike Israel, and with Israel uh, defending itself, it's very hard to get to uh, post-conflict stabilization. And um, so Jim Jeffrey is doing a very good job on that file. Mm -hmm. Brian, I want to thank okay. you. I know it's a very busy week, and we really thank appreciate you, your time thank here you. to let us know what Thanks. you're thinking. Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you.